and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And in his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this in the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. We'll read Psalm 23 responsibly. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures, and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Second reading, Ephesians 2, verse 11 through 22. <laughs> Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth, of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, in his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups in God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints, and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, O Christ. You may be seated. Hi. Let us pray. 
Dear God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. I think we can all relate somewhat to the scenario presented in our gospel lesson today. For we've all had the experience of reporting our accomplishments to people who have been responsible for teaching us how to achieve those accomplishments or people we naturally want to impress. It starts in early childhood when we rush home to report our successes to our parents. Remember how excited you were when you had gotten a good grade on a test or won an athletic event or stood up for yourself or a friend? I know when I did the things my parents taught me to do, things that I knew would have impressed them, I would find myself so excited to make the report that my parents often told me to slow down. Mark doesn't give us much detail about the disciples' report to Jesus. He merely writes that they gathered around Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. But we know they must have been excited because earlier in the chapter, we read that they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Since in the Gospel of Mark, this is their first missionary journey, they must have been amazed at what they could do in Jesus' name. And like all of us who have discovered a new talent or power, they more than likely were pretty full of themselves. I'm reminded of the story of a pastor who said to her spouse on the way home from church one Sunday, and this is not about me, I read it somewhere. <laughs> How many preachers do you think preached a fabulous sermon today? To which her spouse replied, one less than you do. <laughs> when we get too full of ourselves, there's always someone who bursts our bubble. And believe me, a pastor's spouse becomes pretty accomplished with pin-like remarks. This is, in essence, what I think Jesus is doing when he asks the disciples to go to a deserted place all by themselves and rest for a while. It isn't merely that the disciples need rest. They also need to get away by themselves. Theologian H. Stephen Shoemaker puts it this way. In the city, it is easy to focus on the sins of others. In the desert, they have themselves to, do, to deal with. The solitude of the desert became the furnace of transformation where they learned compassion. The disciples must have been pretty impressed with their newfound power and having been around people who were so desperately in need of their gifts, it would be only natural that they would start thinking themselves a wee bit superior. Unfortunately, the sections presented in our Gospel reading this morning skip over two very important events that were, one was in last week's lesson, that are framed by the, these verses. And it illustrates the, to the disciples to learn about themselves in the desert. In verse 35 to 52, we have two miracle stories. The feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water. In both events, the disciples are confronted with their lack of faith. When Jesus asks them to give people something to eat, they are astounded and can't imagine how they are going to feed them with a mere five loaves of bread and two fish to feed the 5,000 plus people. When the disciples see Jesus walking on the water, they think he's a ghost and were terrified. If the disciples had been impressed with their accomplishments on their recent mission trip, their lack of faith in these two instances surely should have instilled some much needed humility. We see that as readers of the gospel, 
But we read that the disciples were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. How often do we, like the, like the disciples, miss the lessons that come from the desert where we are confronted with our own shortcomings? How often does our lack of humility keep us from feeling compassion for others? When we consider the state of the world today, it is not clear to us that humanity's need for power obliterates humanity and consequently kills compassion. When we are full of ourselves and preoccupied with meeting our own needs, it is the unity talked about in our second lesson. It is that unity that we must question, is it remotely possible? Our lesson from Ephesians gives us, a God's, gives us God's vision for the world when it says, Jesus has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. This is the mission of Christ our Shepherd, a mission born out of his great compassion for us, a very frightened flock of sheep. And when we follow the leadership of our Good Shepherd, we realize that this mission of reconciliation and peace is our mission as well. Even without the mission miracle stories in our gospel today, we get the message. The word apostle is related to the verb apostello, which means to send out often with a message. Like the first 12, we are also ones who are sent out with a message. Theologian Douglas John Hall, in his book, Why Christian, has a chapter, Why Church? As part of his answer to this question, he writes, Christianity does have a mission to the world, and that mission is the most basic reason for the existence of the church. There are religions that do not have a missionary impulse in them. But Christianity has been pushed out into the world from the beginning, like a little fledgling bird nudged out of its cozy nest by its parents. That is, in fact, a good simile. Because what drives Christianity towards the world is not <coughs> personal eagerness for exposure to the public sphere, nor a desire to become big and powerful, nor a sense of superiority over every other thing. No. It is sent out, usually against its will, by the God who has called it into being because of love for the world. And later, Hall writes, the mission of the church is of central importance to Christian faith. So much so that it constitutes the most basic reason why the church must exist. Of course, the church needs to have periods of retreat from the world to recover its own identity through study and prayer, to renew its courage, and so on. But precisely in these times of renewal, the church learns once more that it does not exist for its own sake. A church that lived off to itself and was content to be a comfortable fellowship would contradict the most flagrant way, in the most flagrant way, the whole message of the New Testament. 
As we consider our gospel lesson for today, may we remember that the time apart Jesus invites the apostles to take is not only for physical rest. It is in these times that we are called to examine ourselves and recognize our own personal need for a shepherd. And through the humility that comes from that recognition, we learn compassion. A compassion that compels us to fulfill our call as followers of Jesus, our call to be sent out into this hostile world with a message of reconciliation and peace. May we continue to keep this mission before us, reminding one another that just as the apostles were given the power to cast out demons and to heal, we also, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, are empowered. But, as theologian Brian Stockerton writes, we can't simply repeat what the original disciples said and did. We need to discover how we can best spread the gospel in our time and place with our words and our deeds. Let us sing the hymn of the day, number 676. Lord, speak to us that we may speak.
hear our prayer. Once in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. For the Church of Jesus Christ in this and every land, through the one who is the cornerstone of a firm foundation, join us together and build us up as a temple of mercy and peace. In your mercy. Yeah. For the creation, cause new trees to be planted, restrain the melting of polar ice caps, save land from destruction. Like a shepherd tends her sheep, raise us up from among caretakers for all you have made. In your mercy. For the leaders of nations and heads of tribes, where peace seems far off, bring it near. Where justice seems fleeting, bring it to light. Where discord seems relentless, bring harmony. In your mercy. For the health and well-being of family, friends, and neighbors, heal those who are sick, especially the names we lift before you now in our hearts. Give courage to all who struggle with addiction. Touch with your tender care all who reach out to you in pain. In your mercy. For this assembly and for the faith communities represented this week at the ELCA Youth Gathering, nurture the faith of young people as they encounter new experiences and people. Break down dividing walls and inspire collaboration among people of every age. In your mercy. In thanksgiving for those who have died, make us certain that in Christ we are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints in the household of God. In your mercy. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. You may share the peace with one another. You can shake hands, you can hug, you can wave. Peace in the balcony. Peace at the organ. Peace down here. Oh, shoot. Sure.